So my name's Ben, Ben Knight, and I've been with the Wellington occupation uh, from the first day. I've had to have a couple of days out for other commitments, but I've been spending as much of my time there as possible. Um, I put out a message uh, through the mailing list in Wellington and asked as many people as I could if they wanted me to pass on messages to the occupation in Auckland. And because we've only got 10 minutes, um, I've distilled out a common theme between all of the messages that were, people wanted to pass on, which is the utmost solidarity with people in Auckland Occupy. Um, there hasn't been much contact between Auckland and Wellington, except by phone. And one of the main reasons that I was really keen to kind of jump at the opportunity to come up here is to make some face-to-face -face contact with, with Campbell and with others at Occupy Auckland and really, really get this nationwide communication network going so that we can take the first big step forward to get nationwide coordinated action. And that's the first step towards global coordinated action. Um, so seeing the camp in Auckland, it was really, really inspiring. Um, I didn't get to spend nearly enough time there, but immediately seeing the communications tent, seeing the kitchen facilities, I was really, really jealous. If we tried to set up any of these structures, they would be shredded by the wind by the end of the day. We've been having 100 kilometer winds through every second day. Uh, the area that we're on, sadly, uh, personally, I think it's, we're exceeding the carrying capacity of the land and it's turning into a bit of a bog every time it rains. Um, it's kind of a negative thing, living in a bog, but it also is testament to the number of people that are interested in the idea of occupying the Civic Square. So that's the message that we're putting out to the council. There are too many people interested in this idea, so we need to move to a bigger space. Um, so just a quick update on the situation in Wellington. Uh, because I know there hasn't been much communication and it's, you know, it's difficult to go down there and check it out. So basically on October 15th, probably quite a similar process uh, to what Joe described as happening up here. Um, about 300 people, so the crowd is a lot smaller down there, but about 300 people responded to a global call for action put out by the Occupy movement in Wall Street and around the world uh, and congregated in Civic Square. And Civic Square was chosen because there's a really nice view of the stock exchange. You see the ticker going around, all, you know, you wake up in the morning, you look out of your tent, and that's what you see. You see the stock exchange ticket. And TV cameras really like that. And newspaper cameras really like that. So they can come down, take a photo of a, you know, whether they want to make it look good or bad, they can take a photo of a camp with this, you know, stock exchange ticker running in the background. Um, yesterday we had TV One come down. The first day they covered our occupation, they made a real, a really concerted effort to make the occupation seem ridiculous, to make people involved with it seem stupid. They would pick the people that they could most easily stereotype negatively and go straight for them, try and make them say something about being unemployed or being on a spiritual journey. And, you know, just really, they're trying to paint the whole camp and the Dominion Post as well as being a bunch of you know, spiritual acid flashback hippies just sitting around like living off the, the rate payer and really, you know, not achieving anything, not knowing why they're there. And I know that this is a similar theme in the media coverage throughout New Zealand and throughout the world. So the first, we never got the, the first step of being ignored. We had TV cameras down every day from the start. Uh, but we did, we jumped straight to the ridicule stage. And we're just getting through that now. So now we've had TV One coming down yesterday, wanting to get some candid reactions on site to the announcement that ANZ has just posted their $1 billion profit this year. So now they're coming down to us for financial advice, for political <laughs> advice. They wanted some outrage and they were doing a story about corporate greed, so they came down to ask us about corporate greed. Um, the Dominion Post as well has really, really changed their tack. They, for a really long time, they were just pushing this line that there was this immense conflict between Occupy Wellington and the City Council, between Occupy Wellington and the police, between Occupy Wellington and a non-profit children's activities organization called Capital E, which we share Civic Square with. The Dominion Post published a story saying that Capital E, had they had booked out uh, part of the area we were occupying for a Halloween event, 
um, and that it was a territorial dispute between us and them, that we were trying to ruin Halloween for a bunch of children and trying to get in the way of this nonprofit organization and what they're doing. Um, the reality of the situation is the representative from Capital E, the events manager, came over with a tray of cupcakes, said that she supported everything we were doing, but would we mind just moving back a little bit so that they could still have their Halloween celebration? There was immediate consensus that no one in the Occupy movement wanted to get in the way of a children's Halloween celebration. <laughs> the Dominion Post the next day published an article saying that the protesters had lost territory from Capital E. <laughs> they published an article saying that we had been pushed from the green by Capital E, and they did this with a straight face. And you know, Dominion Post readers, generally, I think, wouldn't have that much reason to question, well, I mean, they have reason to question it, but I think they haven't kind of, a lot of their readers, at least based on stuff.co.nz reader comments, which I know are not representative of the whole population, but they do tell you something about some of the people that are out there. Not surprisingly, you get a string of really aggressive comments. I mean, they publish death threats on those forums, on the reader comments forums. They publish really extreme comments seemingly to incite violence. And I mean, if you see what's been happening in Dunedin, the ODT, the Otago Daily Times, is focusing on the grass. Every day they focus on the grass in the octagon. They have a front page story about the grass being destroyed. They have a photograph of the grass on the front page, the damaged grass. They publish stories to put this idea in people's minds that these protesters, all they're out to do is destroy the grass, to steal the grass from the public and destroy it. And so people, Drunks are coming through the camp with this idea in mind and they're setting fire to people's tents with people inside. I mean, to me, the Otago Daily Times is really quite accountable for that. But whether they own up to it is a, a different matter. But, so basically, we've had a really good experience with flipping that sort of coverage on its head. Um, the most inspiring thing for me is seeing this group of people with you know, a similar idea, but a really broad idea. But I, to me, the basic idea that seems to be shared by a lot of people, and I'm not speaking for everyone in the movement, I'm just speaking from my own perspective in Wellington, um, that there's a recognition of a need for a, a real change, a fundamental, a genuine transformation of our political, economic, and social institutions. So to see a group of people with this general broad idea in mind congregate in Civic Square, some of them decide to stay the night, out of that group, don't know each other at all, you get this emergent organization over the next few days. You get committees form out of nowhere, you get subcommittees form out of committees, you get sub-subcommittees form out of subcommittees. All of a sudden you have a really well-functioning kitchen feeding 70 people a day, three times a day, never late for any meal. You have a communications team putting out press releases every day, countering the negative spin that's so consistently put out by the Dominion Post. You have a hospitality team 24 hours a day ready to greet anyone that comes past at any hour of the day. All of this happening with no hierarchical structure. All of this happening, every decision made on the basis of a consensus and a general assembly. Um, so that's where we're at right now in Wellington. It's a lot smaller than the camp in Auckland, but a lot of the same features that make the occupation really positive and that make the occupations worldwide really positive. A committal to non-violence, uh, consensus-based decision-making, non-hierarchical structure, all these kind of emergent structures. Um, we don't have any direct trouble with the council. Uh, I've been dealing with senior council representatives who have expressed a preference that we are gone by the end of next month. So that's what the Dominion Post is trying to cast as an impending eviction threat, is a vague preference expressed that we're gone by the end of, of this month. Um, we don't have any trouble with the police right now, direct trouble. It's not to say that I take their word on everything, but we do have a written agreement now that they're not going to bust in and spring a surprise eviction. Uh, they're going to give us at least you know, the previous afternoon's notice before evicting. Um, and we also don't have any conflict with any non-profit children's organizations. <laughs> um, so I guess when I was scribbling this together on the way up here, um, the theme of the symposium, so Occupy in Theory and Practice, um, I was trying to think of how I could speak, speak to both of those themes. Um, and I figured it, it might help a little bit to give a really, really brief kind of background of how I came to be involved with, with Occupy Wellington. Um, so I'll try to keep this really, really brief. 
But uh, through high school, I studied economics from third form through to seventh form. Um, I learned all about the trickle-down effect and how it was this immutable law of nature that would ensure that the rising tide of, of global capital would raise all ships. Um, at university in Dunedin, uh, at Otago, I studied psychology and anthropology. I never really managed to reconcile the two. I was interested in social anthropology, but the kind of biopsychology, neuroscience side of psychology, never really put them together. Uh, I did a master's in Auckland, uh, focusing on cognitive neuroscience in the psych department. Um, I started a PhD in Scotland, uh, working on cumulative cultural evolution. I uh, got severely disillusioned with kind of the, the fraud of a lot of the way that academia functions in lots of academic institutions. Um, and I mean, I was also sent to Texas to do field work, working with chimpanzees, came to the realization that I never ever want to work with animals in captivity ever again. Um, and I guess, so I'm trying to figure out how all of these different things that I've been educated in and interested in um, can be put together into some kind of useful way. And I've never been able to put them together until yesterday when I sat down and started thinking about what I was going to say in this talk. <laughs> and had a meeting with people that were working with really closely in Wellington, um, working with a software collective, a uh, technology collective called Inspiral. And what they are working on with us, we managed to go into one of their meetings. They're a business, but I don't like to... They're a business, but without most of the negative connotations of the word business, for me. They, they're not a non-profit, but they run on basically the same sort of model that Occupy uses. So they run on a non-hierarchical consensus decision-making basis. And they are so excited now about the idea of developing global consensus decision-making, uh, you know, a web platform to allow this to happen, that they're starting to drop their really well-funded projects to work on this for free with us. Um, we started doing some research, realized that there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people all around the world having this exact same idea all at the same time. And so we've started talking to them. So I live with a guy who's up till four in the morning every night, just on internet relay chat, talking to other nerds around the world about how to put this together, how to put together a global web-based platform for genuinely globally coordinated direct democracy. Um, the first step is to distill what information is good. So there are all these people working on this thing at the same time. How do you determine what's good information, who's working on a, a good idea, who's not working on a good idea? So right now they're kind of laying the foundations for figuring out a way of having good ideas voted on by consensus uh, so that the best ideas go to the top. People who have a reputation for having expert knowledge, reliable knowledge, their ideas float to the top and it's really easy to have this efficient kind of uh, streamlined system for putting good ideas at the top, decided by consensus, um, and then using the same software that's developing the consensus making uh, platform to further develop itself. So the idea for this is to be applied to everything, to every decision, to every communication network. It sounds kind of terrifying, but at the moment they have the best of intentions. It's all open source. It's as democratic, transparent as possible. And they're really learning from the Occupy movement about how to do this. So my role in that process has been to, to be on the ground at the Occupy movement, to learn as much as I can about this form of social organization, this kind of grassroots, horizontal social organization, a, leader, a movement where no one is a leader and everyone is a leader, this distributed leadership model, how to apply that experience to developing a global communication and consensus building platform. Um, I'm basing this on three assumptions. So this is where the theory comes into it. And the first assumption that I'm basing my opinion of what this should do. So this is what they've asked me to do is to kind of give from my kind of diverse educational background to give them a perspective on what I think this system should do and discuss with them what they think it should do. Um, the three assumptions that I will try and find in my mess of notes <laughs> um, that I'm running off uh, the first one is that for something to be considered good, for a decision to be considered good, it should be a decision that benefits the planet, that benefits the world, that benefits everyone, that has a net positive result. So, I mean, it seems simplistic saying that if something's to be considered good, it should be good. 
but that's something that quite often gets lost. Um, the second assumption is that the more people that have their say in what they think is a good or a bad decision, the more accurate it's likely to be. So it's not a definite thing, but the more people you get involved, you have people in every country, their national prejudices just get kind of washed out. The more people you have making a decision together, the less likely it is to be grossly inaccurate, the less likely it is to benefit a single interest group, and the more democratic it is, and <clears throat> potentially the more transparent it is, um, and the less likely it is that you'll get a decision that just completely screws over one group of people at, you know, to benefit another group of people. Essentially, it um, encourages cooperation, it encourages altruism, and it discourages the pursuit of self-interest at the expense of everyone else which is kind of the opposite to the way that our economic institutions are designed right now, which is to encourage self-interest as a virtue. Self-interest at the expense of everyone else, that's a virtuous behavior in our current economic system. That's something that we'd like to change. Um, the third platform, sorry, the third um, assumption that I'm basing this on draws quite a lot from Kropotkin's theory of mutual aid. So this is something I'm constantly trying to get these people to read. I read it when I was 17, so I only have a really, really vague kind of recollection of what I think Kropotkin was talking about, but that's what I'm basing kind of this third assumption on. It's the assumption that the main source of competition is scarcity, whether it's perceived or real, scarcity, scarce resources um, lead to competition. Competition is a major source of conflict. So, the basic assumption that I'm making is that conflict is caused by competition, which is caused by scarcity, whether it's real or perceived. <clears throat> so in terms of designing a system that ensures good outcomes or works towards ensuring good outcomes that are beneficial to the entire planet, if not the universe, but I'm sticking to the planet at the moment, um, that you should design that communication platform, that decision-making platform, to remove conflict, remove competition, and remove scarcity. So you want to maximize abundance, you want to maximize cooperation, and you want to minimize conflict. Um, and basically, with, an, with a web platform, this is relatively easy to do because you design the whole environment. So Kropotkin was basing his theories on observations of animals in the wild, he was a biologist, and he observed that <clears throat> in situations where resources are scarce, so food is scarce, for example, Within a species, you'll have individuals, conspecifics, that will attack each other. They'll physically attack each other in competition for a scarce resource. In a situation where everything's abundant, this doesn't happen. Individuals within a species don't kill each other for no reason. They don't kill each other for, you know, people don't kill each other for access to air at prison until we've, you know, depleted the atmosphere so much that air becomes a scarce resource. So within this environment, <clears throat> we want to maximize abundance, maximize altruistic behavior, maximize cooperation, and minimize conflict. And <clears throat> this can be applied to everything. This can be applied to a total transformation of all of our social, economic, so our political institutions, our financial institutions, every cultural institution that we have, I feel, should be modified and transformed along these same principles. Um, and the really, really exciting thing is that the Occupy movement is already doing this. So this is essentially what's happening face to face in every Occupy movement. It's my understanding that the way that the social structure is shifting is that altruistic behavior is rewarded, consensus decision making that guarantees, well, it attempts to, it increases the chance of an equitable outcome and it moves away from this self-interested model, this reward of self-interest at the expense of everyone else towards an equitable model where there is less financial inequality, there's less social inequality, and there's, everyone has an equal say. So <clears throat> that's the most inspiring thing to me about the Occupy movement. And what we're trying to do is create a communication platform, a consensus decision-making platform that can be applied worldwide. Um, I didn't get time to write a conclusion, but I would just like to say that visiting the Occupy camp in Auckland <clears throat> was really inspiring and really kind of puts this all in context. The idea of meeting face to face to establish a point of contact to get nationwide coordination this week, coordinated action across every Occupy, every Occupy camp in New Zealand 
next week to start focusing on every occupier in the world, getting global coordinated action as has never happened before. Thank you.